This is actually one of the dogs that I was, I myself was looking forward to uh, see. Uh, we're going to have a uh, Ted Corvell from uh, Veronin getting left of Boone. And I, um, I haven't seen the entirety of it, but I've been told that this is a, a, a presentation about dealing with detection of IEDs. Am I correct? In Afghanistan, not Iraq. As I previously said, Iraq, let me correct myself, Afghanistan. So um, without further ado, here's Ted Corvell. Thank you. I appreciate the invite today to speak. Uh, thank you even more for putting me up against the happy hour. Uh, so I thank everyone for being here uh, on a Saturday afternoon. And I know there's a, a networking event going on right now. So I'll, if everyone will turn to the left and introduce yourself to that person, and then to the right. It, all right now you haven't missed anything, right? You've got, you've got networking out of the way, and now you can focus on, on the talk today. Uh, so like Rod said, I'm a retired Marine intelligence officer. So my previous life, my job was to provide timely, relevant, and accurate information to support decision-making to mitigate risk, right? Risk of military operations. Now my job as a cybersecurity effectiveness advisor is to provide data once again to mitigate risk, to drive decision-making, right, or to, for risk, but it's business risk from cyber. All right, so the topic we said is gonna be left a boom. So what I'm gonna share with you is some of my military experiences related to uh, driving data-driven decision-making to support and defeat counter-ID activity, or improvised explosive device activities, right? Because as, uh, as you can probably imagine, right a boom after the bang, mitigation, forensics, it's kind of messy, right? It's expensive to deal with. So getting left a boom is where we want to be, and that same stuff translates here when it comes to cybersecurity, right? So a big part of I'm recently retired uh, from the Marine Corps, so I'm just a little over three years out of, the, of my military service, and a big part of that military transition is being able to adapt what you did in the military to a new space. So many of the stuff you're going to hear me say today is going to be translating military tactics and techniques and procedures into application into cybersecurity, right? So a lot of people here are more technical than me, probably from a cybersecurity perspective, so you may not hear much new, but I guarantee you will hear it in a new way. So the term left the boom was adopted in about 2007 uh, to describe our uh, shift in tactics and techniques and procedures to try to get a left of boom. So in the Marine Corps, all mission planning begins with mission analysis and problem framing. We define what success looks like first, and then we backwards plan from there with the time and materials and personnel available to accomplish that mission. Right? When it comes to cyber, our mission is to protect critical assets. Almost every modern enterprise today, every company, every organization has some kind of critical data assets, whether it be IP or financial data, something from which they derive their competitive advantage from, right? And a loss of that data would be detrimental to their ability to conduct their operations. So as, as we see, as companies are now spending billions of dollars, right, on security tools and services. For 2019, Gartner predicts uh, companies will spend $128 billion on security. So this is becoming a strategic business imperative to get the biggest bang for your buck. Uh, no pun intended. Right? Right? So like I said, this is all about adapting military experiences uh, to the cyberspace. So first, a good war story. Everyone loves a war story. So if you recall, shortly following the terrorist attacks of 2001, uh, we declared war on terrorism. We launched campaigns against insurgents in both Iraq and Afghanistan to fight them on their turf, right, and prevent them from conducting to, uh, continual new uh, operations here on American soil, right? So on one side, you have the greatest fighting force in the history of mankind, right? Trillion dollar budget, highly trained, high tech weaponry, and on the right, you have a bunch of insurgents in uh, sandals and go fasters, running shoes, armed with 70s and 80s era weaponry. It right? shouldn't have been much of a fight. However, we were surprised to see that the, it wasn't quite as easy as it set out. Right? Insurgents had several advantages over us that we didn't anticipate. First, they had the advantage of anonymity. It was easy for them to blend in the local populace. Right? We realized that they didn't have to fight fair. Right? They could adopt asymmetric warfare. 
But the most surprising thing was it took a relatively low amount of technology and simple tactics to have devastating uh, uh, impacts on us, right? For just a 500-pound bomb laying around anywhere could be fashioned into an improvised explosive device and defeat our armored vehicles with catastrophic effects. So we do what any good Marine does. You give me crappy gear, the first thing I'm going to do is hillbilly it up, bolt on some armor, right, to try to protect myself from the blast. Uh, then we invest the, the Department of Defense and vendors get involved, security vendors. They develop strap-on arming and then up armored Humvee variants and HESCO barriers, right, all hardening the perimeter, right? So make it, make it, make it so we can try to mitigate the effects of an of a, a IED explosion. But as you might imagine, it doesn't really matter how hard you harden the perimeter of a vehicle. Uh, the soft Marines and soldiers inside get dead nonetheless, right? So spending right a boom was just ineffective. It didn't matter how much armor or you put around them, a simple bomb could still have devastating impacts on them. In fact, uh, some of the up-armored vehicles just made Marines survive with catastrophic injuries and uh, traumatic brain injuries. So it was exacerbating the problem. We see the same thing in cyber, right? Spending hundreds of millions of dollars on cyber HESCO barriers, right? From proxies and firewalls, DLP, IDS, IPF endpoint, right? Antivirus software, hundreds of million dollars on hardening the perimeter. And just like we saw with IEDs, simple technology can undermine that, right? Perfect example is Experian last year. You see before Congress, CEOs testifying, spent $250 million on cyber in his budget, and yet simple Apache struts vulnerability resulted in the largest compromise of person, PII data for Americans in history, right? High tech versus low tech, challenging problem. So just like we saw with spending lots of money and not being able to defeat the counter ID device, or IED devices, we see the same thing in cybersecurity, right? Large amounts of investment and resources and effort is not equating to cybersecurity effectiveness, right? Something's got to change. We got to think about doing these things differently. Some of the common advantages that I see over the threat I faced then, right, to the, th the threat I face now in cyber is it's relatively inexpensive. Right? It doesn't take much to fashion an IED device from a 500-pound bomb or take a laptop on a few lines of code or if someone saw the first briefing of the day, right? very simple to hack into IoT, super scary, right? Make, makes me want to go off the grid. Right? Does it, it's not expensive to have devastating consequences. Low attribution, just like the insurgents I explained before, could blend into local populace. Hackers can hide in anonymity behind a keyboard. You, it's very hard to, uh, for, when it comes to attribution for who's conducting these attacks. It's relatively easy to do, right? Simple tactics, simple technology can have uh, highly effective when it comes to cyber hacks, right? Frustratingly. And last but not least, you see a high payoff for a relatively small investment and a little bit of equipment, a little bit of uh, energy, sweat energy on a keyboard, you can get high, uh, high value compromise and uh, steal lots of uh, money worth of IP, right? Very common advantages makes it very, very difficult fight, uh, but it's not, unwin it's not unwinnable. So in terms of when it came to counter IDs, we realized that we had to start thinking differently. We, started, we had to start focusing our time and resources and energy to getting left of boom, right? We formed the joint improvised device defeat organization, right, dedicated to coming up with tactics, techniques, and procedures to get left of boom. So big part of that was the fusion of intelligence analysis, right, and, and, and uh, to try to identify uh, techniques and procedures to try to defeat the device, right, and to attack the network, prevent those networks from even deploying the devices themselves. They, they gave us hundreds of millions of dollars in high technology gear, radar, jammers, pre-detonation, all kinds of technical gear that required extensive training to operate. And when you got out into the field conditions with this stuff, it was even more difficult to operate pro uh, uh, properly 
and you won't, weren't always sure that it was going to work the way the vendor told you it was going to work. You just had to help and pray that because you had that lightest deck of gear that you were going to be safe. But in my line of work, I was all about the analytical effort. I was doing the data analysis and the research to try to identify the attack network, right? the insurgent networks, who are they getting their financings from to try and intercept their financing, uh, try to find out who was the bomb maker, doing forensic analysis and identifying who was the technical skill level building the devices, going after them. Um, and then we were also introducing a lot of technology to establish baseline. So monitoring the, the, the roads we were going to travel in advance and then using coherent change detection to compare and contrast, you know, see if there was any changes disturbed earth that might be the signals for emplacing IED devices. So left of, left of boom thinking. Now we're starting to see that same mindset applied to cybersecurity. We're starting to see a lot of companies invest in technologies to get left of boom. A lot more spending on prevention and detection, right, instead of just mitigation, right? So while it might be sexy to do forensics and identify who did it after the fact, right, there's already, the damage is already done. You've already lost that IP. You've already sustained that brand reputational damage. That's very hard to come from when consumers lose confidence in you. So you want to focus on left to boom, right? We see risk assessments, vulnerability scanning, um, penetration testing, security instrumentation, right? Very similar mindset. Let's focus left to boom. So how do we get left to boom, right? This is going to be about mindset, changing the perceptive perception, of looking at the problem from a different direction. So we're going to talk about knowing your enemy, training like you fight, and then inspecting what you expect, right? Military principles applied to this problem set. So let's take a look first at knowing your enemy, right? So all of you, who's, who's familiar with this quote? Most of you heard of Sun Tzu before, right? Art of War, great read, right? This is all about context and relativity, right? What he's saying is it doesn't do you any good to be successful in defeating your enemy. You need to know what your capabilities and limitations are, what your strengths and vulnerabilities are, and you also need to know in context to the strengths and vulnerabilities of your enemy and apply your strengths against their vulnerabilities and shore your defenses up against their strengths, right? Uh, this, is, this is what uh, this is all about. So when it comes to cyber threat actors, we're going to talk about four groups. It's important to understand their motivations, their mindset, what's driving their actions, so you can focus your efforts to counter that appropriately. So we're talking about insider threats, cyber criminals, hacktivists, and nation states. Again, this is going to go back to another war story. So on December 2011, the week before Christmas, I deployed to Afghanistan. Right? Our mission at that time was to set the conditions to turn over responsibilities to the Afghan government, right? Our job was to uh, set the conditions for the safe withdrawal of US forces, because President Obama did me the favor of announcing publicly that fall that we were withdrawing and set a date by which all US troops were gonna be removed from Afghanistan. So complicated our problem. So we were over there primarily to focus on the Taliban insurgents. However, when I got into theater, I quickly realized that it was more complex than that. There were many threat actors in my area of operations that were inter interfering with my ability to accomplish my mission. And these aligned very specifically to the cyber threat actors we're going to talk about. We had insider threat from the Afghan army. We had criminal patriot network over there concerned about drug financing. We had Taliban insurgents, and then we had to deal with nation states ourselves interfering with our ability to do our operations. Start with the insiders, right? Whether it be your grandmother who keeps clicking on that phishing email or your Uncle Jack who's tired of being a dull boy, right? These guys can be very difficult to counter and can have devastating effects morally because they can have catastrophic uh, damages based to their access and privileges that they have in your organization. Why are they so tough to defend against? Because most of our defenses are geared outwards and not inwards. So very challenging. Three main types. There's more than this, but generally in our practice, we see three types of insider threat. You have that careless insider, right? That guy that no matter how many hours of security awareness training you make, you make him sit through, he's still going to have weak passwords. 
He's still going to write them down on a sticky and stick it to his laptop, right? Take a selfie with it in the background and post it on Instagram so everyone knows his login credentials, right? He's still going to put a large amounts of data on, encrypted on a thumb drive and then lose it or lose his company laptop that he doesn't even have a password set on, right? Careless insiders are a constant problem. Malicious insiders, those are the people that could be disgruntled worker that wants payback, right? That wants burn bridges on his way out of town or you're not paying him enough so he's going to go get his some other way, right? Or someone that's um, just trying to destroy something. And the last one is masquerading insiders. So those are people that are not company employees but they get in through, through uh, alternative means, whether that be malware, ransomware, or uh, an actual person breaching into your perimeter. So in Afghanistan, we had the largest, I went over there with the mindset that we were going to primarily be threatened by Afghan insurgents. But it turns out, as you can see in this table here, that in 2011, and then the year I was there, the greatest threat to our forces, the greatest amount of casualties was actually from the Afghan army, a true insider attack, right? For whatever reason, uh, well, we started to do, you know, just imagine how frustrating that is when we were there once again with the purposes of training side by side with them so they could take over responsibility for security of their own country and they're shooting us in the back, right? Extremely frustrating and demoralizing. But even worse than that was no matter how minor the incident, the PR implications that the Taliban could leverage that to reinforce the narrative that they were driving us out of the country was irreparable to our brand image, right, our brand. We're supposed to be mighty American forces. We're supposed to be training them to take care of themselves, and yet we can't protect ourselves, right? Devastating to our brand reputation, right? Difficult to counter an insider threat. Sadly, 17 years later, it's still going on. So I don't know if anyone saw the news, November 3rd, Governor Afghan, or Army National Guard killed by an insider. He was over there a training cadre, killed so still still happening 17 years into the fight businesses can see the same detrimental impact to their brand reputation so here we saw this this summer with Tesla you can see highlighted in red here the impact to their stock price when reports came out of uh, sabotage by a disgruntled employee allegedly he was passed over for promotion wasn't too happy about it so he hacked into the manufacturing operating system on the Tesla 3 production line, right, and, and caused it to, uh, uh, to malfunction, right? Can anyone tell me why the stock peaked on August 7th? Does anyone know? Who knows? Someone knows. Oh, yep, right? Tweet, right? Elon Musk tweeted out that, screw this, I'm going to take it private, right? And we saw an artificial spike in it. But you can see it quickly dissipated because that opened a whole, a whole other can of worms for Tesla, right? They didn't, uh, um, so we can see the double whammy, right? First, malicious insider hacks them, and then a careless insider, right? It's a double whammy. So insider threats, right? Very, very difficult uh, to counter. The next category we're going to talk about is cyber criminals. So these guys are motivated by money. Right? Cyber criminals are in it for the money. But what's challenging about dealing with cyber criminals is you have to fight them and abide by laws that they don't. They don't want to fight fair. Right? So it's, oh, it's hard. To, the, the deck is stacked against you when they're allowed to uh, do whatever they want and you must abide by laws and regulations and policies. As with insider threats, there's a couple of different categories of cyber criminals. Now, granted, sometimes insiders and uh, in, insiders and uh, others and can be motivated by money, but we're going to talk about them separately. For when it, in the context of cyber criminals, we're going to focus on three types. So you have the professionals, purely in it. That's their cottage industry. That's their business. They're in it for the money. We see them now even automating a lot of this through technology or offering cyber crime as a service. Right, making money by doing this on your behalf. You see the mules in the middle who might be naive or coerced into laundering the proceeds from illicit cyber uh, criminal activity. And then you have the getaways, just the youngsters that aren't, uh, aren't as punishable under the law as older people, or they're just, they're motivated out of curiosity or prestige, 
right? Or maybe money. But uh, they, they, can, they can be quickly groomed into uh, true professionals with the right mentorship. So Afghanistan, like I mentioned, we had to deal with cyber criminals. But before we talk about that, let's, let's do a quick geography lesson. So you can see up in the upper right-hand corner, Afghanistan is primarily mountainous with the Hindu Kush Mountains slowly going down into a desert here in Helmand Province, which was my area of operations. So why would it, does anyone know why you would care about this arid piece of dirt, flat dirt? Does anyone know why? Not oil in Afghanistan, but the, there are some minerals, but it turns out that that is actually the most fertile, arable farmland in the entire area of, of, of Asia. So beginning in the 1946, the United States supported multiple projects for the Hellman Valley Association, which was mirrored after the Tennessee River Valley Association. We built a bunch of dams and canal systems to help irrigation. Because in this part of the country, most of the tribes are subsistence farmers. Right? They are growing crops primarily to support themselves. But as the population was starting to grow, we, we supported these type of activities in order to increase crop yields to support a larger populace. Right? Anyone tell me what the primary crop grown in Helmand Province is now? Poppy. You are right, sir. It is not to, to, uh, to supply the demand for poppy seed bagels, right, in the country. It's because uh, what's poppy, anyone know what the sap of the poppy plant can be used to produce? Yeah, opiates, right? Opium, right? So you can imagine, right, for whatever reason, right, mostly they're either, that's the highest yield crop that the farmers could grow, Right, so why grow wheat or corn? Right, when you can grow poppy and make much more money, or you're coerced by Taliban insurgents who will cut your head off if you don't grow poppy. Uh, but we had many different actors in this. In this, uh, our area was disrupted by the fight over this illicit, illicit drug trade. The funds from this. So it was Taliban insurgents. It was criminal patriot networks, and in some cases, sadly, it was uh, Afghan officials. All wanted their cut of it. So very, very complex situation to maintain good order and discipline and stability in a region when everyone's fighting over drug money. And we see business also have trouble conducting operations due to cyber criminals. So we saw last summer uh, HBO hacked, right, allegedly by an Iraqi or Iranian hacker, right, threatened them. They wanted $6 million in Bitcoin in exchange for not releasing unaired videos of uh, episodes of Ballers and Barry or an unaired script of Game of Thrones finale. But you know it takes more than just a little bit of a cyber hacker to take down a Khaleesi, right? Because they still had the largest ratings for the season finale and all seven of their seasons. The next group we're going to talk about is hacktivists. So hacktivists are motivated by money. They're motivated by a political agenda, right? They want to fight against injustice. But in my mind, terrorists and hacktivists are the same. Only their tacti tactics differ, right? They both are motivated for a political agenda or social agenda. Terrorists choose violence and hacktivists choose subversive use of computers. So in Afghanistan, the biggest problem we had to face was the Taliban, right? Again, we were there to legitimize, to defeat Taliban influence and legitimize the Afghan uh, government as the legitimate rulers of that country. But you can see on the right, a recent Wall Street Journal, uh, New York Times article showed that after billions of dollars, 17 years, thousands of lives, they still control a majority of the country, right? Because it just shows you it doesn't take much effort to win that PR campaign, to win over popular opinion. We see the same thing when it comes to cyber, right? Cyber hacktivist groups, right, leveraging low-scale attacks to uh, uh, push their social agenda. So one example here is anonymous, right? You see two attacks here recently, one here in the area, one in uh, Ferguson, Missouri, right? S hacktivist attacks against these governments for... Um, Violence against unarmed black youths, youths, right? 
So again, it didn't take much effort to win that PRCL, to get mass visibility and bring awareness to their cause. The last group we're going to talk about are nation states. Does anyone know what this picture is from? The interview. And what happened to Sony when they uh, were going to release this, this movie? Crippling, devastating impacts, right, from attacks from uh, North Korea, allegedly, right? So uh, we see many countries now building out cyber forces, so it's becoming that fifth domain of war. The challenge is international arms treaties don't address cyber warfare. We haven't updated those terminologies to, to do that. And in some cases, cyber attacks can have more detrimental effects than a nuclear, you know, just as much as a nuclear device, right? We see taking, you hack out the, uh, you hack and take down the infrastructure, electronic grid, right? Our water treatment uh, facilities can have devastating impacts against the civilian populace. As a result, we see most countries doing these types of attacks surreptitiously, right, to avoid attribution. But that doesn't make it any, any easier to defend against these type of attacks. So in Afghanistan, we had to deal with nation states. It was no secret that Iran and Pakistan were openly supporting the Taliban. And in the case of Pakistan, they offered them sanctuary from which they could plan and conduct operations from. So in my area of operations, we had the village of, Bar of Baram Shah. So this village spanned the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. So they would conduct numerous operations against them, right, to where they were staged to prevent the uh, staging of attacks and movement of materials and manpower into our area of operations. But we had to stay north of the line, right? Our hands were tied, right? Again, we had to abide by laws and regulations that they didn't have to. So it was extremely frustrating not being able to retaliate against someone because of some arbitrary line on the ground. Does anyone else know anyone that gets frustrated by not being able to uh, retaliate against someone from an arbitrary line in the ground? Right? Poor dog, right? Foghorn, leghorn. Stand on the other side of the line, right? So I'm not saying that the Taliban are Looney Tune fans. And I'm not saying that Warner Brothers supported the Taliban. I'm just saying that I can't help but note the similarities here between this situation and the situation we faced in uh, southwest Afghanistan. But right now we're witnessing the largest transfer of information knowledge in the history of mankind. And most of that is happening illegally. We're ha the United States is struggling with preventing nation states from stealing our intellectual properties. And this is illustrated here in the case of American Superconductor. So they had signed, they were a manufacturer of wind turbines. They had a proprietary operating system, right, that would uh, produce energy from these devices. China, Chinese company had a contract with them. When they couldn't reverse engineer the solution themselves, they paid a Serbian contractor to steal that for them. So after seven years, lawsuits, right, uh, American Superconductor, they, they had to lay off half their company. It was crippling, and they lost a billion dollars in share and market share. But as you can see, we successfully convicted China of, industri of, a, of threat, and they had to pay a $59 million fine. $59 million fine as a result of a $1 billion in lost value to American company. I do not know if they have paid it. This was July when the when the verdict came out, the sentence was put down. But just so it's extremely frustrating uh, when, you're when your hands are tied and limited to what you can do against nation states. The next military principle is train like you fight. So one of the tenets of Marine Corps training is we train like we fight, right? You heard the old adage, practice makes perfect, right? But I would argue that that's not true. Practice makes habits. Right? So realistic training develops strong, proper habits. Piss-poor training develops poor habits. Right, So as we see in preparation for our de combat deployments, the one of the last things we did was conduct operations in what were called uh, the immersion trainer. So these were purposely built villages full to scale that mirrored villages in Iraq or Afghanistan. 
They have professional hired role players, Iraqi or Afghan speakers, foreign nationals here that play the roles. They were cooked that open bazaar, like fully manned, we would patrol through. And they had Hollywood level special effects, pyrotechnics to simulate devices going off and moulage kits to put blood and gore on people that would simulate lost limbs and the such. So highly realistic training, the last thing you did before you went down range so you can train like you fight in a realistic uh, situation. We see this starting to be developed here on the cyber side, right, with cyber ranges. So specialized socks built up, running active simulations, putting cyber sock analysts through scenarios, simulations to test their skills. Right? Anyone here participate in cyber ranges? Here we go. So I'm not just making this up. I found it on the internet, so it must be true. Right? There's a picture of IBM cyber range. I saw in the back of a tractor trailer, they'll drive up to you on site, let your people walk out in the back of this thing and do some drills, some simulations, right? Or some other ideas in the audience. Did anyone do cyber training? Any kind of realistic type training with their people? Yeah. So train like you fight. So some of the challenges that we saw between, you know, insurgent activities and cyber is you can't defend anywhere or everywhere, so you must identify our critical assets. So raise your hand if you have unlimited security budget. Yeah, nobody, right? Right? Nobody. So you, you are, you're forced to make decisions on where you're going to spend those resources, what tools you're going to buy, what services, where you're going to apply them. So identifying your critical assets is critical. But even if you had all the money in the world, throwing money at the problem isn't the solution, right? It doesn't work because technology doesn't always work the way you think it is. And all these security tools can be complicated to, to set up and configure properly. And even if you had an unlimited budget, even if you bought all the best technology security tools in the world and put it in your environment to protect yourself, it wouldn't matter because it's not a static situation, right? It's a dynamic, fluid problem we're fighting with, right? So on the bottom here corner, you see the OODA loop, right? Observe, orient, decide, and act. So you observe what your enemy is doing. You orient on that action. You decide on appropriate measures to defend against that, and then you act and carry those out. And you're continually evolving your perspective and watching what the enemy does to do that. And the trick to this being successful is to get inside the OODA loop of the enemy. Make, get the initiative and make them react to you, which is difficult to do in a cyber environment. Right? But the biggest thing is it's hard to measure success. Right? An ROI on your measures, whether it be effectiveness of, cyber, of counter ID operations or your cybersecurity efforts, be very difficult to quantify right, with metrics and calculate an ROI. Which leads us to our last uh, tenet, right? Miller's philosophy here. Inspect what you expect. So pictured here is the armor of the Roman legionnaire. So in the time of Roman of Caesar 12, 12 Caesar, they would line up for morning inspections. And the commander would stand in front of each legionnaire. And when he stood in front of them before battle, they would strike their chest with their best plate, base plate, and they would sound off integritas or integrity, right? Meaning that they were whole of mind and body and ready for battle. And the commander would listen for the sound of the armor to make sure that it was whole and to make sure that that protection was in place so they were going to be prepared to defend themselves against the attacks of that day, swords or attacks. So when it comes to cybersecurity, right, how do we measure effectiveness? How do we measure success? So on the left, you'll see most organizations measure with you know, some kind of executive dashboard, which ultimately results in everyone's favorite heat map, right? Which whatever random data you might be able to collect and quantify, you, put it, you sprinkle a little bit of subjectivity in there, and you have a heat map that shows you green were good, red were not, yellow were somewhere in between. So on the left-hand side, we have our flagship intelligence product that I put out twice a year. It was a Taliban versus uh, Afghan government influence map. So it would take six months work, working with multiple stakeholders, gathering some kind of data like number of attacks, right, atmospherics in a village, right, a leader engagement, right, 
blend that all together and draw that piece of dirt red, green, or yellow to measure our effectiveness of our counterinsurgency operations. On the right-hand side is a heat map that was presented at RSA 2016. Right, same concept here. Bunch of random metrics they put together, sprinkled in some subjectivity, and measured against the different categories whether they were good or not good. So what kind of uh, cybersecurity metrics do you guys use here to measure the effectiveness of your programs? Any examples that you might use? Anyone use time since last breach? Yeah? So they compared it year over year comparison between money lost by cyber attacks. And if it was decreasing, that was good. No, oh, we're doing we're doing better, right? They didn't steal as much, so we're improving, right? But if you think about it, that's not really a measure of effectiveness, is it? Because you don't know if the number of attacks went down, right? You don't know how many you blocked, right? If the only metric is the damage inflicted by attack, that's not truly measuring effectiveness. But you gotta have to you have to have something, right? Any other metrics? Any other examples? So what we see is very difficult to measure effectiveness of security because we're forced to manage by assumptions, right? We're forced to believe and assume that the security technology works the way the vendor says it does, right? We're forced to assume that we've purchased and set up and configured the piece of technology security tool correctly. We have to assume that our people know what they're doing. They know how to use it. They know how to follow the processes and procedures for a malware attack. But most importantly, we assume that nothing ever changes. That once we get everything dialed in right where we think it needs to be, that nothing ever changes, right? But you know what they say about making assumptions, right? You don't want to manage by assumptions. Hope is not a plan. So what if I told you there was a way to get quantifiable metrics, evidence of effectiveness of your security tools, people and processes? Let's do a security instrumentation. So security instrumentation by integrating into your security stack, it'll gather quantifiably the evidence of effectiveness of your tools that allows you to measure, manage, and improve and communicate the effectiveness of your security program, right? So security instrumentation isn't just new, it's something completely different. It's shifting that mindset and looking at security a different way. Security instrumentation allows you to identify gaps in your security controls. By, inter by integrating in your control stack and gathering evidence that shows you whether that attack is being blocked or, not, blocked or not, allows you to identify those gaps. But because you're instrumented, you get that data, you can prescriptively tune where your, where your controls are failing and fix those, makes fixes to get those controls to where they need to be. And because you're instrumented, now you can rerun that same test and you can validate that those changes corrected the problem and improved the eff efficacy of your security controls. And then security instrumentation will allow you to automate that process and continually validate the effectiveness of those controls and alerts you if something changes. And last but not least, because you've quantified this in data, now it allows you to clearly communicate the effectiveness of your program and clear metrics and quantify it on ROI on that investment. So now I bet you're asking me, how does it work? So it's a simple concept. So the main component, you have a cybersecurity effect in this brain. This is the central core component that will plan the attacks. And it'll, then it'll gather the, it'll integrate with your security stack, and it'll gather that evidence of how they're responding to those attacks. What actions are they taking? What information is being sent from your firewall to your SIM? Is there a correlated rule that triggered an alert so your analysts saw it? Right? It integrates with all that, collects that data. And then it integrates with sensors or standalone agents that you deploy throughout your live production environment. So these aren't 2,000 agents where you embed them in your database or on your mainframe or in your servers right, or on every endpoint. These are standalone agents that are deployed throughout your environment. So here's what a basic network looks like with all your business zones. Right? You see your standard security controls. Right, your uh, HESCU barriers, right, from your 
firewalls, your proxies, your DOP, your IDS, IPS. Now here's where it gets cool, right? Because your agents act as both an attacker and a defender, they only attack themselves. So it's completely safe. And they, act, they actually execute real test behaviors. So it's not a simulation. They don't copy and, and emulate behaviors. They, they run real live attack behaviors in your production environment. And they do it safely because they only attack each other. Right? So you deploy this and you want it to go through all your security stack. And the integration to the controls affecting this brain allows it to capture all that data measure the effectiveness of it, and generate those reports that let you know, was the attack blocked? Did your Palo block it, yes or no? Did it detect it? If it detected it, did it send it up to your SIM? Did your SIM receive the message? When the SIM received the message, was there a correlated rule that triggered an alert? And then did that alert fire, and so your analyst saw it and was actually aware that the attack was happening, right? All quantifiable evidence you need if you, security, if you instrument your network. Now, once you have that data, you can start having data-driven decisions around risk, right? Risk to the business based on cyber. So across the, on the right-hand side, you see all the different use cases by which security instrumentation will support with quantifiable data. At the bottom, you have breach and attack simulation, throwing a bunch of attacks against your network and seeing if something is stopped or not. Tactical low level, right? You can map that to whatever framework you prefer, MITRE ATT&CK, SANS 20, right? Uh, high tech if you're in healthcare. Now you can start communicating the effectiveness of your cybersecurity problem in terms of a framework that the business understands. So they have a business risk decision. As you move up the maturity level, you can start using this to evaluate the effectiveness of your people and processes. If you're launching the attack and you know what's happening, now you can measure if your people are actually performing the right processes in response to those behaviors. You can validate, if you have an MSSP, you have the data by which you can evaluate the SLA with them. Are they blocking and detecting and responding appropriately? Right? Are they even seeing it? And all the way at the top, what is really important about this is now that you have the data, you can turn cybersecurity into a risk business decision. So for example, you have efficacy that shows if you're concerned about data exfiltration and you're spending you know, 80 million, $100 million on all these tools and you found out that you're only 80% effective and for a million dollars you could buy an, a DLP tool that would give you an extra 10% effectiveness, now you just had a business, now you can have a business level discussion around it. Is 10% risk worth a million dollars to the company? Or would they rather spend that million dollars on something else and accept that risk, right? Business level conversation. As I said, in a former life, I was providing timely, relevant, and accurate information to support data-driven decisions to mitigate risk to mil military operations. With cybersecurity, you can do the same thing if you have security instrumentation, right? Executives in corporate America rely on data every single day to make business decisions. And they use metrics and KPIs to calculate and measure improvement and calculate ROI on their investments. So why shouldn't cybersecurity be the same thing? So during this talk, I covered some of the similarities to my military experience, how you can adapt some of the military tenets of uh, training like you fight, inspecting what you expect, right? Shifting your perspective and focusing on the metrics, data-driven decisions around cybersecurity effectiveness to mitigate risk, right? So hopefully incorporating some of these mindsets and some of these techniques into your programs will allow you to get left of breach. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions. Yes.
Right. So your question was, is security instrumentation, is there a risk to over automating some traditional functions or becoming overly well, reliant on? Right. You're right. So that I mean, that's what's uh, what's important about security instrumentation. It's not meant to automate uh, behaviors. It's not meant to replace humans. It's meant to automate some of the functions so you can collect that data that you need to drive those decisions. So you could choose what tests to, to take, right? It's not meant to replace a threat intelligence feed. It's not meant to be anything. You know, you can program and build your own attacks, but the, the security instrumentation allows you to measure the effectiveness of that and have that data you need to know whether what you're doing is working and what you're, what, if you're protected against the threats that are most important to you and protecting the data that's most critical to you. You're right. There's always a trap, right? Technology automation can breed laziness. Uh, but if you, if you can automate some of the lower level sophisticated techniques, then it frees up your people to be more, to focus on those more advanced penetration techniques or exploitations. Great question. Any other questions on getting left the boom? Security instrumentation? So there was a whole coalition. We weren't there ourselves unilaterally. Pakistan was actually an ally of us. They let us use their rail system to move materials and stuff in there the same. Um, but it's a philosophical debate. They're Muslim country. Taliban is Muslim. Um, so sometimes the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of thing. Uh, Iran, didn't. They, they would provide a training or sanctuary to conduct operations from. Uh, so it's just it's just a tumultuous, uh, chaotic environment in that country, even or in that area of Asia already. Uh, yeah, so lots of countries bordering that to just view that Afghan as a place to do proxy fighting. We won't fight each other directly, but we'll fight each other through the insurgents. So enemies of us wouldn't fight us openly, but they would support the Taliban to fight us indirectly which we did to them, the Soviets, in the 80s, right? Turn around is fair play. We supported the Taliban in the 80s when the Soviets were in Afghanistan until they withdrew, and then now we take our turn in the barrel, so to speak. So that's awesome. Thank you. Saw some more hands. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Right. So her question was, you know, it's India refers to that territory as something other than Afghanistan, right? Am I perfect? Right? Because if you think about Afghanistan is a European Western European convention, right? British colonized most of the world and drew arbitrary lines around people that aren't necessarily view themselves as Afghanistan. So if you recall, I mentioned in my particular area, it's mostly tribes, right? So the majority of the Afghan people are loyal to their tribes, and it goes back thousands of years. They don't see themselves as Afghanistan, right? So they weren't open to interference from us or the Taliban or even the government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, at that time, President Karzai. They didn't care. They're subsistence farmers. They're taking care of their tribe. They don't want anyone coming into their lands and bothering them. So it's a very, very uh, challenging, dynamic situation. Um, so lots of lots of things, different things at play in that area of the world and many other areas of the world to include the Middle East, right? Sometimes not everyone agrees those lines on the draw that the lines on the ground are drawn appropriately, or they ever choose to follow them. Yes, sir. So when you're saying that this would be able to start to make these attacks that are known to threats that are also known to the community that you just said, the idea of getting this work to be getting new data and knowing that you're going to be getting that from the same people that are going to be getting it from the same people. And as you described it, certain adversaries 
Right. So your question was, are we collecting data by which we could turn over to government officials or law enforcement f officials to help go against some of the criminal activity or insider threat or such, right? Um, we, we don't collect the data, right? Uh, our, my particular company, we sell a product that does security instrumentation. So full disclosure, right? Um, we th it's a more of a business analytics tool, a platform uh, from which companies can collect and do that data themselves. We are involved in a lot of the uh, ISACs, and we do a lot of work embedded with the government. Uh, we work with MITER. So we are leveraging our platform to collect the data that they can have to use. Uh, they collect the data internal to their stuff. But what's important about uh, the point of the, uh, knowing different threat actors was Security, you can't, you have to look outward when it comes to the security, right? You have to decide first, what are your critical assets? What do you want to protect? And then you have to understand and put that in the context of what are the likely threat act vectors, uh, actors and vectors they're going to come at me with and design your attacks around the primary threats, right? Or in military terms, the most likely avenue of approach, right? Because you don't have unlimited resources, you have to prioritize those. So you have to prioritize those in accordance with what you think is the most likely threat, right? And then you just have to start while the other actors could potentially breach you and you could have, uh, you, there you assess that they're a lower risk to you. So you have to prioritize your limited resources to that. Does that answer your question? Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Um, so that's a great question. I can tell you that Gartner has put us in the breach and attack simulation quadrant a uh, category. So our primary competitors in that space are Safe Breach, Attack IQ, Simulate, right? But when in terms of, but we are not a cybersecurity tool. We're a business analytics platform. We just happen to reside in cybersecurity for now. So breach and attack they'll tell you, was an attack successful, yes or no, right? Security instrumentation, when it comes to breach and attack, it's a yes and response. Yes, you can leverage our platform to conduct breach and attack simulation. However, our attack behaviors are not neutered. They're not simulations or emulations. They're real attack behaviors, right? But on top of that, the instrumentation integration into your entire stack gives you evidence of how your security controls actually responded. Did your Palo block it, yes or no? Did it send an alert? Did an alert arrive to your SIM? Did it receive it? Was there a correlated rule that triggered an alert so an analyst saw it, right? That is all what security instrumentation, the, the evidence of effectiveness and the data that it collects above and beyond breach and attack. Correct. They do, yes, so they'll deploy, yes, they'll do, simulated attacks against your network and tell you if they were successful or not. Great question. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Any other veterans in the room? No? All right. Well, I appreciate you all coming out. I appreciate your time. I look forward to getting to know uh, more for the rest of the day. If you want to know more about security instrumentation or hear any more war stories, come find me or uh, Desiree in the back. She also works with me. We'll be more than happy to tell you more about us and our company. Thanks. Nice.